new year, new webinar. Happy new year. Um, we also, it sounds like we've got a new, a new name for it. We're the Simply Smarter Show now. So welcome to mm, the Simply Smarter mm. Show. So we're here today. Jack is having some, some flight issues. So you get Mike and I, but we're here today because food is a fundamental and powerful element of our lives, right? It nourishes our bodies. It fuels our daily activities, but it also has the ability to bring people together like in this webinar, um, and create meaningful connections as well. Beyond personal and social significance, food pay plays a crucial role in shaping our world. Our food industry is a ma major global force um, with the power to impact the environment, the economy, the health and well-being of the people around the world. And it really is, think about what that means, right? So any thoughts on um, kind of as we think about the world and what I was just kind of speaking about and talking about um, was all created via AI. So <laughs> we, we typed in, <laughs> that was a, a little scripted, but um, we did just type in, write an inspiring introduction for the Simply Smarter Show. And again, I love the fact that we're calling it the Simply Smarter <laughs> Show. Um, that talks about the power of food in people's lives and how insights about consumers in the food industry help companies succeed and also achieve a higher purpose, right? So it created out of two sentences, this very nice put together um, welcome acknowledging what it is. So this is generative AI. We've talked about this a little bit in the past, whether it's on this webinar, whether or not you've seen Jack or any of us, the rest of us speaking at other conferences, this is something that we expect to continue. We are going to be talking about this kind of throughout the year. So know that this is something that will continue to be a theme for Data Central in 2023. I think too, it's, it works so well that you're joining today, um, Kelly, because I think if Jack had said this, people would immediately know, like, this is not something like Jack would say. And so, but like with you, it was, you know, I felt like, wow, we're really like getting into some deep, deep topics here. And I told Jack when he pulled this up, to me, this is written better than a lot of what I see humans writing. Like, I think it's, it's very well, it's uh, maybe a little bland, but I think like it's grammatically correct. Like I, I think yeah. it, it did a pretty good job actually. Agreed. I could, I couldn't go on to that second, second one. I thought it <laughs> like, Kelly is just a robot. What she the heck is she talking about? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, we've got people chatting in. So make sure that when you're chatting that you click everyone so that everybody can see what you're writing as opposed to just Mike and I. Um, so make sure that you're doing that. Um, and we say that every time and there's always still people who don't do it. So really take time and make sure that you've selected everyone because otherwise, but yeah, it's only myself and Kelly that can see it. Yeah, we'll start calling you out now. <laughs> <laughs> um, so here's a good question for us to put into, into chat, right? So what are, where are you today and what foods or beverages do you currently have within arm's reach? So I'm going to have Mike tell us first, but also <laughs> in chat, if you have no food or not a single beverages, beverage around, write nothing, right? Still type in, mm, if you have nothing, because mm. we want to mm. see how many people, right? So Mike, what have you got? <laughs> So I, I mean, like I, knowing this was coming, I just went into my kitchen and pulled something. Um, but so I had uh, traveled to Portugal in early December and we went to this restaurant that specialized in tin fishes and it was the best experience of the whole trip. And so I ended up buying way too many tin fishes, something like, um, I want to say uh, 70 tins or something like that. But the cans, the packaging themselves are so beautiful. So I want to make sure you can see them. Um, I gave them as gifts for Christmas. Um, you can see this one here. Um, I posted them on my Instagram. Uh, they're just, they're so well, but they're also so delicious. They really, I mean, Portuguese tin fish culture is amazing, but I feel like the art of tin fish could be like a museum exhibit somewhere. So, so that's I what I have right in front of me. 
I, sh I showed my husband your Instagram post and he was like, <laughs> where do we get those? And I'm like, we have to go to Portugal. <laughs> you got to go to Portugal. <laughs> exactly. So yeah, if you need me to buy any off of, off of you, buy them. So, um, and I am actually at my parents today and my mom told me, um, she's like, you know, telling me all the different foods that they have here, but they have a raspberry orange. So what? it's like raspberry on the inside. So I'm excited to try that when we're done. So I haven't opened that, haven't unpeeled that yet, but that is going to be my, my lunch for me today. Is it like red, like, like reddish pinkish? It is. Like oh, I've it's, never yeah, heard of that for all that we do in the food industry. I've never I know heard of kind of not, not quite as blood as, as red as a blood orange. So mm. a little pinker than that. So I'll send you a photo, Mike, when I'm done. Oh yeah. I want to hear, I, you should join the next one, but I really want to hear how it is. <laughs> <laughs> and I also, Fair when enough. I'm controlling the PowerPoint, so I can't see the chat. So um, I, I think you, I, I don't know. Can you see it? I can see a little bit. Yeah. Okay. okay. I can see it so what are, what do and other people have? Um, we see lots of stuff, but I feel like the most important piece was to see how many people said nothing. That, yeah. And very few people said nothing. There that, are still some, yeah. but it is this idea that no matter where we are or what we're doing, it is this idea that, especially from a work environment, there's always something you know, to drink or to eat in arm's reach of us. So I think that's Absolutely. always kind of an interesting Absolutely. perspective. But we do have some new news. We are going to move from every other Thursday to the first Thursday of every month for the Simply Smarter show. Um, I think I saw somebody said that maybe maybe that's already a podcast, so I might be <laughs> on the <laughs> trademark there. Um, but um, we've got a couple other things that we're going to start to do um, kind of with our current clients. We want to be able to free up a little bit of time. And so we're going to start doing these once a month on the first Thursday of each month. What will happen after this webinar, you will get an email from Zoom and it will have a new um, recurring meeting for you. Click on that, um, add that in. Um, it does sound like if you add that to your calendar and you use Gmail, it will replace the old one. If you have Outlook, delete this webinar first and then go in and um, add this, the new meeting to your calendar. And you shouldn't have too many problems once you do that. Um, but other than that, we'll be all set. And we're getting good thumbs up for making sure that you show up every single uh every single month because it'll be more rare to see Jack. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> when if you and if you do have any issues whatsoever, I mean just send us an email at hello at datacentral.com and we'll get you set up. I think part of it too is also, you know, when we started the Simply Smarter webinars, it was during COVID and there was so much information that needed to be, you know, disseminated on a weekly basis because we were all trying to figure out, you know, what's going on. Whereas now, you know, each month's show is going to be um, a lot more momentous, you know, I think we're going to showcase a lot of the data and information um, that, you know, is about our changing industry and that, you know, really shocked us. So, so I think, yes, the shows are, you know, a, a, you know, there's a longer cadence between them, but I think the actual topics for each show um, are, are going to be a lot more momentous each month. Yeah. Perfect. So again, first Thursday of every month. So, all right, we're going to talk a little bit about some data from our flavor database. So our flavor database is pretty cool database, we've got uh, over 4,000 words, whether it's um, a flavor, an ingredient, a food, a beverage, and um, it. we get questions. Um, Mike, if you go to the next slide, we'll use prickly pear as our example. Mm. So the data that we have is prickly pear, do you actually know what this is? And if you click to the next slide, we'll just zoom in on that. So do you know what it is? So 60% of consumers actually know what prickly pear is, That's but only 26, right? right? <laughs> <laughs> and only 26% have actually tried it. I'm sure it's a little bit higher than that. There are definitely times, I always think about this in terms of like um, togarashi, that mm -hmm. people have probably had togarashi and maybe maybe didn't even know that it was included mm -hmm. in a dish that they had tried. So it's that, do, do you know what it is? Have you tried it? And have you had it many times? We also ask, what is your affinity for this? So do you love it, like it, neutral, 
dislike, hate. And then because we're asking all consumers, there's also that idea of, I have no opinion. But when we take all of that information and look at the look at this kind of plotted out, we've got quite a bit of different um, information here. And what we're looking at is along the, um, the going across the bottom, we have what percent of people know what this food or flavor is. And then there's the tried it is one to a hundred on um, kind of along the y-axis. So kind of an interesting piece as well here, right? So there's things that you can't ever go past that line. So if you don't know it, you can't ever try it. <laughs> right? yeah, makes sense, it's, yeah. You may have tried it, but you can't tell us that you've tried something if you don't know what it is. Um, but there are some things that are those outliers. So things like horseradish, knowing what it is. So 85% of consumers know what horseradish is, but only about 50% have tried it. Mm. Lavender, 70% know what it is, but only about 30% have tried it. And then prickly pear, which is where we started from. 60% know what it is, um, but only about 20% have actually tried prickly mm. pear. Um, interesting when Jack presented this at President's Conference, a couple of these slides, and we all went to dinner and there was a drink with prickly pear and we're all <laughs> we can... <laughs> making sure that we for sure know that we have tried that. <laughs> I'm surprised then, so many people have not tried. I mean, I, maybe it's just kind of like a, a self-selection because people think it's spicy, but horseradish, I'm surprised, you know, like, I don't know, to me, like at least at one point in your life, you would have tried horseradish. You would have had it and gone, yeah. I don't like that. Now, yeah, like, yeah even like to learn that you question. don't like it, yeah. <laughs> exactly. So this is um, still knowing it and tried it, but there we've got turducken. Right. So people know what it is. Very few people have, have, tried, it, have tried it, which makes perfect sense. Right. Yeah, so yeah. it is if we look at all different global foods, um, we see kind of a different structure there, too. And so we'll talk a little bit more about this in a minute. But what sets us up for this is the next slide. And oh, with so with the global foods, we've got things like sushi, 90% know it, but only 50%. That's what concerns me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Why have you tried that? Um, tofu, I can understand. I love tofu, but I can understand people saying that is not for me. That is, mm -hmm. I am not vegan or I'm not vegetarian. Um, so that makes sense to me. I mean, sushi is interesting, though, because it is one of the most polarizing foods in the database, where you do have all these consumers who love, love, love sushi and like eat it all the time. But then you have these consumers who are like, I don't eat raw fish, as opposed to there are some foods that are very hated, like, you know, liver is the most hated <laughs> food in flavor. But there's not this group of passionate people who also really love liver like there is with sushi. I'm sure there's a small group of people who really, I like liver. My mother yeah. would be one of them. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, what sets us up for kind of where we're going with this conversation, and let's see if anybody in the chat knows where this is coming from. So this is an, a study that was done in 1967 at Oregon State University. Um, you see a person sitting there in a bag we got nobody, nobody saying anything, just <laughs> <laughs> cheering on Oregon State University. Um, but what this really is, is that it was a speech class. It was speech 115. And the professor was aware. But what happened is the, the class comes in and a person comes in in a black bag. Didn't say anything. They sat at the back. So we've got a few different people um, who are who are catching on to this. But it's really, really interesting that, and I'm just going to read this because it really does epitomize kind of what happened during this experiment. It was every single week, the black bag showed up to this class, never spoke, sat in there. But initially, black bag initially was socially rejected by the rest of the class, which made sense. It's not normal to have somebody in a black bag sit at the back of your lectures. Black bag was the subject of ridicule, ostracized destined to be a lonely student with zero friends. If black bag minded, it never showed. You can't see his face mm -hmm. or her face. But as the term progressed, the student's views about black bag changed. So hostility turned to curiosity. It then shifted to a sort of distant 
fondness. So by the end of the course, the classroom's overall feelings had morphed into something that could loosely be termed as friendship. Black Bag had become part of the furniture, one of the gang. Everybody had gotten used to Black Bag for no other reason than because they were there. And so this is an idea called mere exposure. So we had a couple people um, who saw that. And it is this idea of if you're exposed to something, your preference for it increases. And there is this idea that this goes along with food as well. But thinking back to, think about the first time you tried black coffee. Did you love it? Mm -hmm. Maybe, maybe not. Beer would be another one. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, another good example is a song on the radio. The first time you hear it, you're like, I don't really like this song. And <laughs> you hear it over and over and over again. You're like, oh yeah, I'm singing along to it. <laughs> so it does kind of move, move kind of through this idea of the more we're exposed to something, the more we like that, the more we like it. And so the effects of mere exposure on the next slide, um, we get to this idea of it really does kind of have an impact from that food preference perspective. So we'll, yeah. we're going to kind of investigate that a little bit more. Back to that. Yep. So <laughs> this whole idea of knowing it and trying it. So, right. So there's that line of no versus try. If you don't know it, you can't tell us you tried it. <laughs> and then you see, if you go back to that slide mm -hmm. quick, Mike, um, you see that we're still pretty far. There's a lot of outliers on that bottom and that know it, but haven't tried it, um, but not getting as close to the line. But on the next slide, when we start to get to this, okay, I've tried it and like it, we're much closer to that try versus like, and that line of saying, okay, once I've tried it, I potentially might like it. So if you go to the next slide, we'll just see that difference again, right? So further away from that line, closer to the line. So it's just giving you that feel of, yeah, if I've tried something, if I know what it is, and then I've tried it, I have a, a better um, scenario where I'm actually going to like something. So it is that really interesting piece. And so we've got a couple different pieces here that we're going to take a look at. So some outliers here. Um, food coloring. <laughs> <That makes perfect sense. laughs> I know I've tried food coloring. But I'm not sure that I like it because um, I'm not sure it should have have taste. No GMOs. I think we'll change with that GMO perspective as we move forward. I think as people learn about what genetically modified means, you know, thinking about what a banana looked like 50 years ago to a banana today. We've talked a little bit about some of that over the years and I'm seeing all of the comments about MSG. We need to think, <laughs> right? Yes, have, yeah. That's I actually, we're going to talk about it later as part of the Good. 2023 trends too. Yeah. Excellent. Which I love. Yeah. I've got my <laughs> shaker of MSG next to my stove and use it and love it. Some people have it next to their desk. They should have written that in. <laughs> yeah, said, really? you have anything next to my, within arm's reach. Um, so it is, it is this idea of getting consumers, right? You're exposed to something, you try something. But the piece that we as, you know, innovators and marketers need to do is, if you go to the next slide, Mike, is to, right, that's our whole goal. And we think about this limited time offers and what we're trying to do from that perspective is we're consistently introducing something new to consumers. So introducing something new, how do we get them to try it? So it's that idea. Do you know what it is? If you know what it is, how do we get you to try it? And then, you know, that the <laughs> whole idea, you know, take away from this in general is the next slide is really our job is to encourage trial. That's really the idea of encouraging that first time trial, getting them over that hump. There's so many different ways that we can do this, um, that we're going to be talking about this throughout 2023. This is going to be a theme for us. Um, I, I think back to some of these things as well. We, we talk about our scores testing and that idea of being able to show people new things. It circles a little bit back to that regenerative AI where we've shown some examples of how 
when somebody is testing with scores, they might say, I don't have a photo yet with, with generative AI, we can build that photo for you. So how do you get that photo? How do you get someone to think about something new, see the photo of what that new thing is and get them to try it? So this will be a 2023 theme for us. Absolutely. And I think um, we're, we're about to talk about the 2023 trends, but we actually have a section in the 2023, the full trends report that's going to release in Report Pro early next week. And it's some of those kind of low hanging fruit. It's the options that we find in flavor that once consumers do have a chance to try them, they tend to like them a lot. So it's those options that, you know, you can put on your menu and you can feel kind of safe that a consumer is going to like it. And the best thing about those is consumers have such a good experience with your brand in particular if they try something new that they've never had and they really like it. They remember that, you know, that location that I was at or that chef that, you know, introduced me to it was the person who did that. And they really enjoy that. And they love to share that with friends and family. So, so it's a really, really good experience from a brand standpoint when you can do that successfully with uh, consumers. Yeah, absolutely. All right. We've All got right. a poll. This is Let's a see real if we can get it to work. Okay. <laughs> I'm going to launch it. There we go. All right. So yeah, for 2023, Simply Smarter Show takes place. <laughs> and I, wow, I've never, I don't think I've ever launched a poll. Jack always launches them. And it really is in real time. I mean, like you see the numbers. Um, I'm a little nervous. There are, there's still a good percentage of people. Maybe they came in late. and They, they might have come in late. Part. So it's good but, that we're doing But this. you guys are doing pretty well here. I'm pretty impressed. Yes, yeah. Um, <laughs> can you can you see it too, Kelly? I can actually see it. Yeah. Okay. For a while, for, I feel like as others have, have uh, been on the webinar, they haven't been able to see it. Now I'm just okay. wondering if everybody else can see it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, oh, we can end it. I think it I think so, yeah. Pretty much. Okay, share the results. Yeah. You can see here. So most people sense. got it. Yeah, 80% um, <laughs> are, are now aware that the Simply Smarter Show will be on the first Thursday of every month. So if you were a little late, we, we announced that at the very beginning. Um, so those 15% of you, Totally understand you came in, you were running from another meeting or finishing your lunch. Um, but we're going to start doing these every on the first Thursday of every single month after this um, webinar, you'll actually get an email and it'll you'll have instructions on how to do that. So okay. I'm wondering and I'm going to turn people over to who, you, Mike. who just made up a day and said we're going to do it on Friday. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, so before we get into the 2023 trends, there are a few new reports in Report Pro. So if you don't know by now, Report Pro is our smart library in this SNAP system. So it's where we keep all of the new um, reports that we produce, all of the great content that the content team produces. Um, I mean, at this point, it's thousands and thousands of reports, and there's new reports every single week. So the, the two that we want to focus on here are number one, this I think just came out yesterday. It's the new economic indicators report for January. So it's all the economic data from December put into one report. So as we head into the new year, obviously, you know, the economic landscape is a big conversation that we're having. We're going to head into a recession. What are things looking like? Um, this is the report that I would definitely say, you know, start your month off with it. See where we are economically as a country and kind of what that means for consumers. So a uh, brand new report in Report Pro. The other one is part of our SIPs series. So the SIP series is a look at alcohol and what's happening in and alcohol and alcoholic beverages. And in particular, we just released a number of reports that are specific to a wide variety of venues. So it's what's happening within the alcoholic beverage category within all of these various venues. So what do casual dining consumers want? What do they drink at casual dining operations? What are they drinking now versus, you know, what were they drinking last year? So we have all types of venues in here. Um, there's casual dining, there's kind of all the restaurant segments that you can imagine. We have lodging in there. We have, you know, on-site segments. So if the alcohol beverage segment matters to you or you work in one of these segments where alcohol beverage is a factor, I would definitely encourage you to jump into Report Pro and read the latest SIPs reports on what's happening in Elk Bev um, for all of these different venues. 
And so now we're going to get into it, some of the 2023 trends. I mean, we could talk about them for four hours. You know, the, I think the if you saw the food bites that we released in February or in December that goes into some of the trends that we're predicting for 2023, I mean, that alone, we could talk about everything, the, everything that's in there for a few hours. And then early next week, we're going to release the full um, deck. So it's actually something like 250 pages. It's all the data. It's, you know, presentation worthy slides. That to really dive into each of these trends that we're predicting for the next year. And so uh, I, I had to pick and choose what we were going to include in here. It's it's I, I'm when I say it's a minuscule amount of what's actually in the report, I would say you're probably looking at five to 10% of what's in the actual report. But I think it does give you kind of a good idea of what's in there and you know some of the things that we're looking at and talking about for 2023. And the number one, you know, we just talked about economic indicators. If you remember from December, we asked operators, what was your number one concern as we head into 2023? And by far, the number one concern was high prices. Um, it was something like 87% of operators said that they're worried about high prices in 2023. Um, it was, you know, by far the most universal worry for operators. Just under that was the labor shortage. Uh, but even that was, you know, far off from the number of consumers who were really worried about a high price. Prices. Here we ask consumers, you know, what do you think the landscape is going to look like in 2023? And you can see here over half of consumers think that we'll enter a recession in the year ahead, and another 27% say that we're already in a recession. So when you couple that with the, you know, operator numbers, it is, you know, a, a lot of worry as we head into the new year. Um, and that was something that we also saw with consumers. I'll show you a little bit um, at the end here. We asked consumers just to give our industry some advice for 2023. And the number one thing over and over was just figure out how to give me food that's a little bit more affordable. You know, prices were really, really on consumers' minds. I will say the most pessimistic demographic where millennials um, millennials were the most likely to say that we'll enter a recession in 2023. The least pessimistic were actually um, kind of the two generations at either end. So Gen Z was the least pessimistic and boomers were the least pessimistic, which I think is kind of interesting. Um, I also think it's interesting if you, you know, are a manufacturer, a distributor, an operator that primarily targets families. Millennials are kind of in that, you know, generation where they're raising families and they have kids now. And so, you know, that's the demographic that's most worried about the, the year ahead. So um, you may have a consumer base who's a little bit, you know, leery about spending a lot of money in the year ahead. Um, the other thing, I know everybody was wondering this, this is, the, um, we asked this in the December webinar, which was, um, you know, what were consumers' number one health goal in 2023? And 68% of consumers said that it was this. So these um, are the blank letters, it's like a hangman game here. I was surprised <laughs> the number of people who got it right, not knowing any letters, nothing in last month's webinar. Um, I agree. Was, was kind of, are people getting it right now? They're like, getting it right. Yeah, it's amazing. Yeah. I, 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 we just have a really intelligent audience. I think. Yeah, um, it's I'll, drinking. I'll drink to that. Yeah, yeah, I'll really. I, did. I, have, well, I promise there's water in here. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it's drinking more water. So 68% of consumers want to drink more water in 2023, making it the top health goal overall. I think I, one, I mean, it's a little bit unsurprising because, um, you know, it's kind of something we can all agree on. We're supposed to drink more water. It's not very polarizing. We also see a lot more focus on, you know, drinking water again. So we see apps that track, you know, are you drinking enough water each day? We see some of these products that are hydration multipliers that are supposed to, um, you know, multiply the amount of hydration that you're getting in your body. So we do see a little bit more of a focus on, you know, drinking more water as part of your health goals. But then this is a question we asked about a wide variety of health tactics and what consumers are going to do in 2023. You see that, you know, drinking more water is on top there. But overall, the things that we saw really rise to the top are kind of basic things. So it's things like exercising. It's a lot of mental health things. So not even necessarily physical health, but things like reducing stress or getting more sleep or taking care of your mental health. So it's kind of the, these basics like exercising and drinking more water and then taking care of our mental health. Those were the things that, you you know, a large percentage of consumers say they plan to do in the new year. I would say that the only thing about this is if you look at it from demographic to demographic, there's a wide variety of differences here. So younger consumers are a lot more likely to say that they're going to reduce their stress. They're going to take care of their mental health. 
Whereas you get older, um, a lot of the things that you're trying to do are, you know, targeted to specific needs that you have. So maybe you have a chronic illness. And so you're, you know, trying to take care of that. So you see a lot of these things like reducing salt to reducing your sugar intake um, that really kind of stand out with older generations. The other interesting thing here is only 11% of consumers say that they're going to start a new diet, which I know is a, a big thing that we're all talking about as we, you know, start a new year. But you can kind of see how diet culture has really fallen off. And just that term and that idea of diet culture isn't necessarily as popular as it used to be, although it's actually a double that percentage for Gen Z. So 22% of Gen Z consumers say that they do plan to start a new diet in the year. So I think the, the kind of takeaway here is that the basics are very important to all consumers, but personalization, um, you know, to each individual consumer when it comes to their health needs and tactics is kind of the, the story for the year ahead. And then getting into some of the sections. So we talked a little bit about these sections in the December webinar, but this is the section that we're calling, are these trends dead? So it's kind of all of those, uh, you know, hyped up trends that we talked about either before COVID or during COVID. So it was things like ghost kitchens, NFTs, the metaverse, plant-based foods, where there's a lot of hype surrounding them. You know, it's gonna be the next big thing. We're gonna see it everywhere. And then, you know, um, you know, for some of these COVID really supported them. So, you know, food delivery and ghost kitchens were one where there was even more hype during COVID um, just because we needed things delivered. And now, you know, we kind of feel that that uh, the story around them is maybe changing a little bit where you hear a lot of people talking about, okay, maybe these weren't the, the greatest ideas, uh, you know, maybe they're dying off. And that's something that we see so often when it comes to hype. You see that huge, huge hype that, you know, this is going to be everywhere. You see all of these businesses coming in. They want to be first. They're, you know, launching a bunch of new products and businesses. So there's all this hype around these categories. And then inevitably, some of those businesses aren't very good. You know, some of the foods aren't very good. You know, some um, of these companies got in there just to make money and they didn't necessarily create a great product. And so you see some of those businesses dying off. And then all of a sudden, you see kind of the tide changing. And it's, well, maybe this was overhyped. Maybe it was a bad idea. Is this, you know, segment or this, you know, new offering, is it dying off? If you're interested in this, um, I would suggest looking up the Gartner hype cycle, which is kind of um, gets into this for technology, but I think it works for food too. And then ultimately what ends up happening is a lot of these things, the good ideas stick around and the bad ideas die off. And we have the, the good ideas that, you know, really resonate with consumers and made sense for our industry that kind of stick around in perpetuity. So the only one I'm going to focus on, I think we have about seven of them in the report itself, but the one I'm going to focus on is probably the one that we get asked about the most in relation to 2023, which is plant-based meat and specifically meat, not plant-based food overall. So we're specifically looking at plant-based beef chicken, um, you know, seafoods and those options. So this is the question that we asked of operators, which of the following options most aligns with your plans for plant-based alternative meats as we head into 2023? So I think there's been a lot of talk about, you know, all of these different operators are dropping plant-based meat from the menu. You know, some operators are adding more plant-based to the meat to the menu. And that actually is what we're seeing. So it's a relatively small number of operators who do say that they plan to remove some or all of the plant-based meat from the menu. So 7% of operators overall, as whereas four times that number, 20 8% say they plan to add more plant-based meat to the menu in 2023. I think part of this is that a lot of the operators that weren't seeing success in the category have already removed it from the menu. And so this was fielded in November. So we saw a lot of that shakeout happen um, earlier in 2022 and into the summer. There is also a lot of nuance here from um, segment to segment. So you can see here that we broke it out um, by the various segments here. I think it's very interesting, you know, nearly 40% of fine dining operators say that they're going to add more plant-based to the menu, um, plant-based meat to the menu in the year ahead. You also see um, B&I and C&U, we're getting into the 80% category where those, you know, segments are saying we're either going to add more or we're going to keep the same amount. Whereas you do see some of those QSR fast casual operators who do say that they're going to, um, you know, dropped somewhere from the menu. Um, fast casuals um, was and healthcare was actually the top two segments that said that they're going to drop it from the menu. I think the other thing happening here is because a lot of times people ask, well, we've seen a lot of the businesses that, you know, make plant based meat and they haven't necessarily been reporting great numbers, is that there's been so much fragmentation in the category. 
So as before, there was one or two operators who are really dominating this category. Now we have a wide variety of operators or manufacturers who are offering a wide variety of different plant-based meat options across categories. It's not just ground beef anymore. We have chicken, we have seafood. So even if you know some of those operators were dropping particular brands, they still have a wider variety of plant-based meat options to add to the menu in the year ahead. So just some numbers to put behind kind of what operators plan to do in the year ahead. We asked operators, um, you know, do you think this is a long-term trend or a short-term fad? You can see 60% of food industry operators do think that it's a long-term trend, and 40% say that it's a short-term fad. If you look by segment by segment, um, those on-site operators, often called non-commercial operators, were far more likely to say that it's a long-term trend. So healthcare, BNI, CNU, those were the operators who said, I think this has legs and it's going to go far. Um, this is consumer data. So we asked consumers, do you plan to purchase plant-based meat substitutes in 2023? So 40% say they um, do plan to purchase them in the year ahead and 60% do not, which 40% is still a large number of consumers so, uh, you know, who plan to purchase this category. And if we dive into that a little bit here, so you know, we asked consumers this question on the left-hand side, which is you know, as you're thinking about some of these plant-based meat substitutes, which of the following is true for you? So for about a quarter of consumers, um, or uh, yeah, uh, they currently purchase plant-based meat and they plan to continue. So they're already purchasing the category. It's a part of their you know, weekly purchase habits um, and you know, they eat it and consume it now. But it's these two just below that that we wanna dive into. So 3% of consumers currently purchase plant-based meat, but they don't plan to continue into 2023. It's a relatively small percentage. And then 17% of consumers Say that they previously purchased it and they stopped purchasing. So there's this 20% of consumers, one fifth of consumers who either stopped or plan to stop in the future. So why is that? That's kind of the question we all want to know. Um, you know, if we're seeing this category kind of stagnating, what are the reasons for that? The number one reason consumers say that they tried it and they're not eating it, um, you know, into the future is that they only tried it out of curiosity. They saw all the hype around it. They saw all of these operators launching it on the menu. It sounded interesting. They felt like they they had to try it. And there really wasn't anything that kept them, you know, purchasing the category. You can see just under that, the number one reason that they stopped, um, specific reason is that it was too expensive. And just under that, under that was that it doesn't taste as good as animal-based meat. So they were very curious about the category, but then, you know, it's more expensive and it doesn't necessarily taste as good. Nobody's going to keep purchasing products that they don't think taste good and cost them more unless they have, you know, they're very, very concerned about a very particular thing like animal welfare. So, so I think this is difficult. You know, there's going to be a lot of difficulties for the plant-based meat category in the year ahead. So you do have some of these consumers who clearly they're open to the category. They've already tried the category in the past, but they had a bad experience with it. So even if you've changed your formulation, how do you get those consumers to come back and try it again? You also, um, you know, in this left-hand chart to here, you see the one-third of consumers who say they've not purchased plant-based meat, but they're open to it. Or the 22%, I'm sorry, the 22% the who have not purchased, but they're open to it. So you have about a fifth of the population who's never tried it, but they will try it in the future. But how do you make sure that they don't have the same experience that we see on the right hand side here? We have to make sure that, you know, when they do try it, that they are more delicious. And, you know, they're, um, we do see prices dropping. So that may not be as much of a concern in the future. I think the other thing that we definitely see happening is kind of a shakeout in the category overall. There's a lot of products not all of the products are great. You know, we haven't necessarily seen kind of a clear, um, you know, kind of marketing focus for the entire category on why consumers would choose it. So I think we're going to see a, a lot happen to this category in the year ahead, but I absolutely wouldn't count out plant-based meat in the year ahead, if, you know, looking at these numbers on what operators plan to do and what consumers plan to do. I don't want to spend too long in lab-grown meat. Um, did we have a section in it, you know, in the report? But um, it is going to be a story for 2023. The FDA, you know, did preliminary approval of it. Um, you know, I think we'll hit it, see it, we'll absolutely see it hit the U.S. market and U.S. restaurant menus in the year ahead. So we ask consumers, are they open to it? 22% of consumers say they are open to eating lab-grown meat. 
45% of consumers would not eat it, and there's still a third who are undecided. It is, um, you know, pretty polarized when it comes to generations. The younger you are, the more open you are to trying um, some of these lab-grown meat options. Um, so I think it's, it's going to be really interesting. We're going to see. I think the thing that um, is very interesting about the category is the pricing and what we'll see happen with pricing into the future. The next trend that we'll look at is video and how video is impacting consumers and impacting the food industry. I think, you know, three, four, five years ago, everything that we were talking about was Instagram, 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 you know, and it was creating foods that looked really visual so consumers could take pictures of it. Probably remember all of the restaurants that were installing lighting specifically so people could take pictures. And very quickly, we've moved from, you know, static photos to um, video and particularly short term short form video. And that's particularly true with younger consumers. Um, this kind of shift has happened so quickly. So if you don't really have kind of as either part of your social media or marketing strategy, or even just your overall strategy, kind of a, a strategy for video and where video plays into that, I think 2023 is definitely the year to do it. So one in three operators has already posted a video of their business online at some point. This is another one that there's a lot of variation from segment to segment. So nearly 50% of fine dining operators have posted a video at some point. CNU operators are a lot more likely to say that they've posted a video. But already we see that there's operators who are using video online to market their businesses, market their foods. And there's a real desire from these operators for support from manufacturers and from distributors. So in the past, if you would supply photography to you know, some of the accounts that you would service so that they could use them on Instagram and other social media platforms, I think in the future, Future, there's going to be a real desire for, um, you know, video, and they're going to need some some B-roll of your, you know, uh, your product in motion so that they can use it either, you know, online in social media. We already see it happening, um, you know, on menu boards, in kiosks, and apps. Um, you know, if you don't have, you know, kind of a, an infrastructure to create video at your business, um, you should probably start looking into it. There's we get far more into it in the full report itself, um, kind of in which social media platforms that um, specialize in video that consumers are using. But this is a question we ask specifically around which platforms are you creating content for? So you're not just consuming content, but it's the actual platforms that consumers are creating video content for. So they may come into your business and actually take a video of their food and um, you know, post it onto one of these platforms. So by far, whether it's usage or whether it's actually creating content, YouTube is on top. Um, every generation, it's their number one most used platform. Sometimes I think we ignore YouTube because it's kind of an older platform, you know, it's just in the background, but it is still, you know, consistently used by, uh, you know, consumers. So, so absolutely don't ignore YouTube. I think the interesting thing here, though, is, and the thing that has really driven all of this is TikTok. You know, um, TikTok, it felt like TikTok came out of nowhere and really took over. And you can see here over half of Gen Z at this point has created a video for TikTok. You actually see a slightly higher number even for Instagram stories. But it's any of those social media platforms where it's very, very easy to share some type of video content with, you know, your followers. I think the other thing about TikTok is there's a lot more discourse on TikTok. So it's not just necessarily putting something out there and it sits out there statically. You see a lot more people playing off of other people's videos. So, you know, you see somebody's video and you reply to it. There's a lot more commentary happening in the comments. So there's a lot more of a chance for consumers to talk about your brand and, and you know, what's happening. Um, and so I think you know, uh, uh, that was 51% of uh, Gen Z consumers had created content for TikTok. In total, um, it was another 30% who have used TikTok. So it's 81% of Gen Z consumers who have used or created content for TikTok at this point. So if you consider a trend to just be you know, the result of communication. I share something with you, you share something with your friend, and that's how a trend gets started. I mean, a lot of that discourse is happening on these types of platforms. So you can see where, you know, especially for younger consumers, where these trends will come from. The question that we always get asked is, you know, what happens if TikTok, you know, goes away? Or, you know, there's a lot of questions about, you know, are we going to ban TikTok as a country? Uh, it's so popular at this point that I think either it will be very hard and they'll just, you know, have to 
they're making a lot of money out of TikTok. So they'll either sell it to a US um, you know, entity, or the thing we'll see is that there'll be you know, a competitor that comes up and everybody will switch over pretty easily. I think the popularity of it just means that there's gonna be some need for something like that into the future. We did ask a little bit about what types of video content consumers wanted from brands and restaurants and operators. And you can see that here. I think the overall story is that we're a bit behind where consumers want us to be. A lot of these options are found at very, very few restaurants. And yet you can see there's a large percentage of consumers who want these types of options. So, you know, well over a third of consumers want videos from their favorite restaurant showing how they make dishes. They really love to see how their favorite dishes are made, the secrets of the restaurant. And yet it's still a fairly small percentage of, you know, operators who are offering that type of content. You can also see some of the demographic skews here. So 28% of Gen Z says that they want scannable QR codes on menus that link to videos about the specific dishes which I know we've covered a couple operators who've done that in the past on these webinars, but it's still, you know, a very, very, very small percentage of operators who are doing that. So you can see some of the needs and wants that consumers have surrounding video. The other thing that we'll talk about here is this idea of a new third place. So it's really, you know, the idea that entertainment is going to have a really good year again in 2023. And part of the reason for that is because, you know, yes, we've changed a lot during COVID, but fundamentally as humans, we're still social creatures. We still want to meet other people. We still want to meet, um, you know, share meals together. It's like what you said, Kelly, you know, at the, the top of the webinar, we're sitting down, even if it's virtually, and we all have food in front of us and we're sharing it together we still want to do that with each other you know absolutely and so I think, you know, as we can go out to restaurants again, uh, you know, we're going to see that desire for places that, you know, we can share experiences with our friends and family and loved ones all over again. Uh, just recently, uh, you might have seen David Buster had a particularly great year in 2022. Um, I think even compared to pre-COVID numbers, not just compared to COVID numbers. So there is this desire for consumers for some of these third places, some of these entertainment concepts again. And part of that is because so many consumers don't even have a second place anymore. So that idea of the third place was always, you know, we had our home, which was our first place. We had our work, which was our second place. And then we wanted that third place. Well, now work and home is people's only place, you know. So for 31% of workers, they work from home at least part of the time and a full 13% work from home full time all the time. So you have this cohort, over, uh, almost a third of the population who is home for a good percentage of the time. And so, you know, I think the restaurant industry and the hospitality industry in general has a, a really great role to play here in offering the types of places when consumers do want to get out of, of their homes again, um, you know, giving them that, in this case, second place for some of them, third place to go to. Um, and so some of that is the, you know, the comeback of entertainment. Uh, pickleball, you know, America's fastest growing sport. If you look at the number of, you know, new pickleball entertainment concepts that are scheduled to open in the next three years, it's insane. Uh, uh, every market either already has a pickleball option operator or has, you know, a few waiting in the wings to open. And the thing about them is they all have great food, uh, you know, as part of the, the kind of sales, um, you know, um, kind of the, the proposition that they're they're putting out there. They have great food and wine. Um, and this is Camp Pickle. This is the, the person. I want to see who started Punchbowl Social. This is kind of his next, um, you know, iteration. And so I don't, I don't know if you play pickleball, but, let, you know, I'm very curious about it. Uh, yeah, I have not played pickleball yet, uh, <laughs> but yeah, it pickleball. Someone just said pickleball is the new golf, but it's, it is. Yeah, I mean, it has its own magazine. I have, and there are conferences I go to that have pickleball. Um, so I might have to do that in January. We should, we, we should try it. To. Yeah. But I think too, I mean, you don't also, you also don't have to create an entire new entertainment venue to, you know, get consumers out of their houses to, you know, go on a date or to meet with their family again. Even some of those, uh, you know, QSR operators who have released new builds and those new builds are primarily focused on takeout and delivery. A lot of them, when you look at the rendering, they still have, um, you know, like a cornhole game in front, or they still have some experiential element. Even bars in the neighborhood here will have things like, um, you know, board games or, you know, books that you can borrow, just so that, you know, there's uh, uh, something beyond just the food that, you know, these operators are offering. The other thing that we continue to see is because so many consumers are working from home and because we also see so many operators cutting their late night hours, they're opening earlier in the day and offering up their restaurants as co-working spaces. So um, in my own 
neighborhood here, there's a number of restaurants and bars that during the day they serve coffee and you know pastries and things like that. And it's a co-working space during the day. And then right when it hits 5 p.m., they become that restaurant again. So um, I definitely think we're going to see you know entertainment um, you know really make a comeback in 2023. We did ask questions here about you know kind of consumers and how they feel about these various things when it comes to working from home. So this was a question of only those consumers, the 31% who say they work from home at least part-time or full-time. I was surprised by the number of consumers who, you know, it's the top question here, prepare their own meals more often when they work from home. So 43% do, but I thought it would have been way higher than that. You know, I work from home 100% of the time, and I would say I've cut down the number of restaurant meals that I either go out for or get for delivery by 80, 90%. I cook from home way more often yeah. because I work from home. So I think my that's mind's, very surprising. Though. Yeah, my mindset has changed. So it's like, no, I, we have to go out to eat because yeah. I feel like I'm there and I just, okay, we've got stuff I'll cook. Um, so now it's like, okay, now we I'm making sure that we're doing a concert, concerted effort to get out. To and, get out? Yeah, sure. Absolutely. Yeah. Like, yeah. I got to get out um, of the house. I need my I second a, third place. <laughs> I actually have a friend that she, her resolution for 2023 is um, she wants to fall in love with Chicago all over again. So every week she's yeah. going to do one Chicago-ish activity that makes her realize why she lives here, which I think is a really cool That's idea. That's smart. Actually. Yeah. We should um, all do that. Yeah. There's also the, the so it is one fifth of consumers who say they're missing their coworkers and just socializing at work. So it's not a huge, huge percentage. I miss working with you, Kelly, definitely. I know, um, same. <laughs> <laughs> but it is, you know, it is a sizable percentage. There is that, you know, um, large percentage of consumers who do miss it um, and probably would go to a co-working space or, or a restaurant in order to meet other people. And then this is that question that I talked about earlier. So it was a free text or verbatim question where you know consumers could tell us anything they want. Um, it was a, an open format; they can you know type in there. And we just asked them, "What advice would you give the food industry for 2023? Anything under the sun?" We didn't prompt them. Um, there was nothing that we said you had to, to limit yourself to. The number one thing that we heard over and over and over was lower prices. So this was a consumer who said, "I want lower prices. I know you're all hurt." to, but it's simply become unaffordable, possibly offer smaller portion sizes for a lower price. So I think there's a few things going on in here that we saw over and over again. One is the number of consumers who said that they understand that the food industry is hurting as well. So it wasn't just, you know, oh my gosh, I go out to restaurants and it's so expensive, or I go to the supermarket and my bill is so high. It's that I know why that is. I know that you guys are hurting too. So it wasn't necessarily that they don't understand where it's coming from. Number two is there were a lot of consumers who said that was fine as long as um, you know there were other areas that we compensated for it for. So if I got really great service or the experience overall was really great, they kind of understood. But we heard from a lot of consumers that their experiences were bad in those areas too. So I also got really bad, uh, you know, service. I also, you know, experienced, um, you know, some some poor, um, you know, options um, when I was at the restaurant. And so, you know, if you go to a restaurant and you know the prices are really high and you have bad service. And and, you know, there's a lot of things out of stat. I mean, consumers know this, unfortunately. The other thing that I was surprised by the number of consumers who said this was um, to offer these smaller portions. So there was one consumer who said that I would love half size portions. There was a different consumer who said that they try to order from the kids menu that they can. There was a different consumer who said that they wish that entrees came in the same types of sizes that you get at Starbucks. So they wish they could get either a venti entree or a grande entree. And so I think that's a really great tactic. You know, so it's a way to offer lower prices to consumers. They get that same great experience and it doesn't necessarily um, devalue your own brand. So if you lower prices so much, it becomes really, really difficult to raise prices again after, you know, any recessionary pressures are over. So this makes it a little bit easier, um, you know, to, to kind of keep that from happening. We had a lot of consumers who wanted very particular things to come back. So, uh, you know, there were a few consumers who mentioned this consumer said the McDonald's snack wrap. I believe there was a consumer who had heard the McRib was leaving and they were very distraught about it. So, um, you know, there are a lot of these LTOs or menu items that consumers really want to see, you know, come back. And then these were some of my favorites, the number of consumers who were very positive and just said, you know, hey, you know, you guys are doing a great job. Keep at it. You know, and I, it almost felt like therapy where all 
these consumers were, you know, really just supporting us. This is a consumer who said, I just love trying new food. So, you know, as an industry, just keep creating. And so in the report itself, we have, um, I think there's like 50 or 60 of those answers that consumers gave. Um, and then very quickly, we'll go here through. So there are 10 different flavors that we chose that will be everywhere in 2023 and 10 different flavors that will be everywhere in the far off future. So the second list is something that we always do. You know, we always have those 10 far off flavors, um, kind of the, the weird kooky stuff that's only on, you know, less than 1% of menus, but that we think should be on your radar. But for the first time, we're doing the, the 10 foods and flavors that you've heard of these, you know, they're growing on menus, uh, but it's kind of just, um, you know, puts that backing behind it if you need, you know, that reason to make the leap. Now, I don't think these three will be any surprise to anybody that's watching today. Number one is ube, obviously the color, you know, we see it everywhere, the growth of Filipino cuisine, um, particularly important in the baked goods category. So we see so many baked goods that use ube in them now. Um, it's and so a great beautiful. example. How do you not? <laughs> no, right? Seriously. And there are so few, you know, purple foods like this as well, you know. Um, so this was the Ube Coconut Swirl Ice Cream from Baskin Robbins this year. So a great example of, you know, a major operator in the country who is putting Ube onto the menu. And this scored, you know, in our scores, concept testing database, this scored well, particularly with younger consumers. And it scored highly in that all important, both I want to try it and it's unique, those two metrics. So it was something that consumers want to try and also something that they could only get from Baskin Robbins. Spicy maple, uh, you know, if you're looking for a new sweet and savory flavor profile to put on the menu, if you don't already have spicy maple um, on the menu, it scores so well with consumers. They absolutely love it. If you've done a hot honey, a spicy maple is a great option, particularly as we get into the fall and winter months and we see a lot of, you know, the maple options growing on menus. If you're thinking about, you know, fall and winter flavors for next year, spicy maple is a great option. These were the spicy maple breakfast sandwiches um, that Tim Hortons did this year. Yuzu, another one, you know, we see it everywhere. Uh, this is really becoming almost a new default citrus flavor, you know, kind of that cool default citrus flavor, particularly in the beverage category. So this is the 50-50 Yuzu orange cider from Shake Shack. They did a number of Yuzu drinks in the past year. And then the three flavors for the future. I apologize, I'm going quickly. I know we have three minutes to go and I just want to make sure that we get through these again. Um, the three flavors for the future. So again, these are far off um, black tahini. So tahini has been growing on menus for a number of years, primarily because of hummus. But in the past few years, we have seen tahini being used a lot more often on its own. So black tahini is just using black sesame seeds. And clearly here, it has that really vibrant color. So it's, you know, really striking. And that's why we see it. Same reason that we see ube on menus being used because of that striking color. Um, you can use it in really a wide variety of applications. Um, this is the black tahini frozen dessert from lavender and truffles. So lavender and truffles is a plant-based um, frozen dessert operator based out of LA, and they do a number of really interesting flavor combinations. And this is their black tahini option. It's actually sold out. That does really, really well for them. Um, and it kind of, you know, they say that it's almost like doing a peanut butter ice cream where it has that really creamy flavor profile. Um, that's there. So we talked about MSG. So we saw last year a number of operators calling out MSG on the menu. So specifically saying, you know, this is our, uh, the example I'm going to show in a minute is probably the most famous one for 2023, but it was the MSG martini from Bonnie's in New York. But we saw a number of operators specifically saying that we're putting MSG into, you know, the various foods that we're creating. And I think there's a number of reasons for it. One is I think we're finally rounding the corner on MSG and kind of, you know, consumers being aware that the reasons for cutting MSG out of, you know, your diet or out of foods weren't necessarily, um, you know, based on any factual evidence at all. Um, and indeed, there was a lot of racism involved. And so I think particularly younger consumers have, have really realized that. And I think the other thing that when you talk to a lot of operators on why they're doing it, um, it is almost kind of a, a, you know, a playful way of putting something on the menu that's like, I'm going to put it in your face. You know, it's not, it's not just a martini. It's literally, I'm pouring, you know, MSG into the martini. And We're so Bonnie, why was, wouldn't we say it? Why right. We, yeah. You yeah. know, like, and the, and that's what, so this is the MSG martini from Bonnie's. This is the, the bartender who created it here. And like they say, there's so many people who order it specifically because, I mean, you see that on the menu, it's called the MSG martini. You have to order it. It's kind of a provocation a little bit. 
And then the very last one is cherry blossom. So the flavored cherry blossom in Japan called Sakura. So you've seen, you know, those floral flavor profiles growing on menus for years, lavender being up on menus. We had honeysuckle in our, um, you know, annual trend report a couple of years ago. But we're seeing this grow so much overseas, obviously in Japan. So the example here is, you know, Starbucks Japan did their Sakura strawberry shiratama frappuccino here, and then this blooming milk latte. Um, in the UK, Aldi has um, actually Actually, uh, a cherry blossom liqueur, a gin that they sell. So we see it, you know, really growing on overseas menus. And so the leap to U.S. menus isn't necessarily super high. And the color is amazing, you know, and has that really cool so beautiful. color. Um, so those are the the six, the the three that should be on your radar for 2023, and the um, six far off ones. Oh, really quick, I know we're at the top of the hour. 76% of consumers are excited about new foods and beverages, and 76% of operators feel more negative than um, more positive than negative about their business in the year ahead. So there is a lot of positivity. There is a lot of excitement um, on behalf of both consumers and operators as we head into 2023. All right. Thanks. Mike. And then, yeah, so that's it. And uh, again, the Simply Smarter webinar, it's moving to the first Thursday of each month. You're going to get a, a new invite. Um, join us. You know, we can't wait to see you in February. These have been so fun. Uh, we can't wait to do them with you um, all over again in 2023. And um, uh, the next one is February 2nd. So about a month from now. We'll see you in a month.